freedom and happiness. That's all I want, freedom and happiness. Whenever your gut instinct is screaming at you, you got to listen to it. Oh, what's the secret of business and all this shit? I'm like, you've got to go and create it and take it. Hang out with the people who are doing the kind of stuff that you want to do. There's endless examples of people who are traveling the world and making their money online and your whole life changes. You're listening to The Remote Revolution Show, the show that brings insights from industry experts across the world of digital business, so you too can take your business online, travel the world, and live with freedom. If you're new to the show, the podcast is produced every Tuesday for your enjoyment, and show notes can be found at www.remoterevolutionshow.com. Come back often and feel free to add the show to your favorites in your YouTube, Spotify, and iTunes feeds. If you want to follow us on social media, which you should because we're awesome, join the community by searching for at Remote Fit Pro, where you'll find daily content to help you explore the remote revolution oh yeah and if you want to connect with us individually you can do that too via the links in the show notes now let's get into this week's episode with your hosts james moody and george crawshaw hello and welcome to the remote revolution show today we're talking about branding we're talking about your message we're talking about the stuff that really matters if you want to go out there if you want to make an impact if you want to get more clients and really find a way to put your words and your story across to the world. Okay, we're interviewing Des the Braver and she is from Bulgaria. And she talks about in her story where that's probably one of the poorest places in the world and she came from a very underprivileged background but now has created a super, super successful business and she travels the world, she lives with freedom, she creates huge impact and she speaks on stages, educates many, many other businesses and entrepreneurs on the power of branding and how to help them build a loyal community of brand ambassadors around their business. All right, Des is a super inspiring and interesting person. She has so much information. She really does know her stuff. And I really hope that you get a lot out of today's show because this topic in particular is one of them that's made such a huge impact to our business So we know the power of branding. We understand the power of knowing your message and actually getting that absolutely nailed down. Most of it we actually learned from Des herself before this interview a long time ago. So enjoy this episode. Let's get over there and meet Des. Des, thank you very much for joining us today on the Remote Revolution Show. Thank you for having me, guys. Yeah, I think we've, we've, uh, we've got a few people in our community who follow you and are excited to hear what you've got to say. Got some questions preloaded for you that we'll surprise you with later on. Um, so, firstly, Des, let's kind of get started with a bit of backstory of you, like how you got started in the entrepreneurial world, uh, the kind of you've got the remote lifestyle yourself. How you got started in, in all of this business stuff online? Honestly, most people have this super inspiring story of how they decided to start a business, you know, and my story is literally. One day at work, I got bored and I <laughs> decided to sign up on a freelancing platform. It was Upwork. Um, don't sign up. They take 20% of your profit now. But I signed up there and I thought, huh, this stuff is pretty cool. I can do social media management and copywriting here too. And I was only working part time. So I thought, why the hell not? Um And literally within two weeks, without even trying that hard, I replaced my income from my job and I thought, okay, well, I'm bored here anyway, so I just left. And that is the whole inspiring story of how blood, sweat, and tears led me to start my business. I mean, that was me starting the freelancing journey. It took some time to actually turn it into a proper business, but that was the very beginning of it. (laughs) Love it. Love it. I was inspiring. You know, no. he just went off and was like, fuck it, I'm going to do this. I love it. It's cool. So what, what yeah. did you what did you get started in doing? So you, you say copywriting, a bit of social media stuff. What, what yeah. was it that you were working on? So actually, right before I started, uh, as I told you, I was working uh, for a startup in Copenhagen, right? And there I was doing a little bit of everything creative from marketing to blog posts to articles to interviewing uh, employees for... Uh, for the blog and all kinds of stuff like that so it was a lot to do with just crafting words really putting words down on paper so I thought you know this is really interesting and I started studying copywriting properly online I was also doing a master degree in branding so that helped a lot Uh, it was in English 
Um, and after a while, I started, I, at the time I was working for $8 an hour, by the way, that's important to know. I was valuing myself at $8 per hour and I was super happy about it. I thought, oh my God, people want to pay me $8. Well, people in my country work for <laughs> twice as less, you know? Um, so I was doing blog post writing, article writing. I was even writing eBooks for clients. Um, I was managing social media platforms and after a while, you know, it just became very, I realized I'm not making any real impact. You know, I'm not changing anyone's life. I'm not changing anyone's business. And that's what I really wanted to do. That's what I studied to do as well. So that's why after a while I decided to transition from this into what I already knew so well, branding. Nice. That's cool. That's super cool. And what was it what was it like then when you decided right i'm going to turn this into a real business what what was that transition like it was very interesting um so the very beginning it took me about two months yeah two months to rebrand myself so what i decided to do i sat down made a whole rebranding plan because people think rebranding is very easy just start talking about something else <laughs> that's it call yourself something it's not you know there's a whole process and there's there's three to five different types of rebranding, right? Um, so I took all my presence from that freelancing platform, moved it over to my own social media platform. So that was the best thing um, that I did, started building my audience there. And that just exploded because right at that time, live streaming appeared and I became an early adopter of that Periscope, Facebook Live, Instagram Live. Perfect timing for me to move my presence there. So literally within... Two months, I went from working for eight dollars an hour to landing my first thousand dollar clients. And I remember I went on my first three sales calls in one day. I had no clue what I was doing. And I landed three clients at a thousand bucks each. And I thought, oh my God, what the hell have I been wasting my time on so far? I literally get to get into these people's businesses and revolutionize the whole business. And I'm getting paid well for it. So it was huge for me and it did take a lot of effort. The toughest part was building the audience, but it worked out. Des, I really want to touch on the point you made about going from $8 an hour. So obviously it wasn't $1,000 an hour, it was $1,000 for a package. But yeah. this is where so many people struggle is because they can't value themselves at that high level. And I'm sure you work with a lot of clients who are the same for making that transition or have in the past. Uh, what are some of the mindset shifts that people have to go through to increase their perceived value of what they have to offer to the marketplace? One of the things that really stands out for me is a lot of clients. Um, I work with two, two types of people. One are very established business owners who are just looking to take it to the other level. And then we have the people who have a business but are stuck. So they're in the beginning stages. So those people, they come to me and they say, oh my God, I really want to offer a high ticket package, but what should I include? So they put everything in there and they always feel like to increase the price, you need to keep adding and adding and give, give your soul like put to the devil, you know, sell your organs or whatever. And no, that's really not true because the truth is I, I have a paid community, right? And when I started it, I felt this exact same way. I was charging $10 per month for that community when I started and I was giving them 20 things to take advantage of. And what ended up happening is people were so overwhelmed, they decided not to join, even though it was $10 a month because it was too many things. So that's one of the mindset shifts that really needs to start happening more often in people who are just beginning. You don't need to throw more stuff into the mix. People actually pay more for only a few things if you're very, very clear about the benefits, not the features, the benefits of what they're going to get. So that's definitely the number one thing. All right, cool. And I want to go into how this applies to branding as well and simplifying brands because prime example, the more mature like Instagram has become, just as an example, it's off my head, the simpler everything has looked in their interface, including their logo, like the very visual branding. And I know we'll talk about everything behind visual branding as well because I know there's a lot more to branding. Um, but the simplification of brands why does this happen and why do people end up charging more for something that looks less? What's the, what's the shift that goes through in people's psychology for this? It's honestly, first of all, it's a cliche, but it's true. Our attention span, I think it's down to seven seconds now, which is worse than the goldfish's attention span, which is crazy. I read that somewhere recently. So I have a friend, right? And he does visual branding. 
websites mostly and he was trying to sell himself as doing everything so what i do and plus the websites right so a whole agency but he was not promoting himself as an agency just one person so when people see that they think oh you know he doesn't specialize in either so that's where our minds go as soon as we see a person trying to do a couple of things even if it's all under the umbrella of branding we go oh i prefer to pay more money to someone who specializes in a website specializes in internal branding because they know their stuff even though there's sometimes it's not even the case. So from a psychological standpoint, that's why brands try to make things so simple. That's why brands selling products all the time, just to selling one product. I've personally been responsible for that decision a few years ago when I was working with a brand selling, uh, uh, what was it? Candles. I was saying candles. They had a thousand types of candles and people were very confused because they had too much of a choice. When you give people too big of a choice, they cannot choose. That's why That's why when you go to any shop in America, you have 12.5 different types of ketchup and people just stare at the whole line like zombies and spend half an hour there. It's a nightmare. Don't do that with your brand, please. I had four membership levels to my community when I started. Now I have two, maybe even just one when I launch it next time. It's really interesting that because uh, George and I are huge fans of Frank Kern. Like everyone will probably know him as the amazing copywriter, marketing genius. And yeah. he speaks about this right now as he's gone through this whole journey of 19 years in the industry, launching hundreds, if not thousands of products. Now he just has one product. And he's like, all I care is about my one product, my membership site that's 397 a month. And then I have my private clients on the side and I just scale, 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 scale that. Um, how do you identify that product? So let's go back to the candle story. Maybe more relevant for our audience, the coaching industry. When you've got a coach who's got 50 products, how do you identify which one's going to be the money maker and which also is the one they're going to enjoy delivering? What's the process that you saw go through when making that decision? I can give you a perfect example with my business because right now I'm in the process of massively scaling it and we have had to let go of a lot of stuff over the last month. My team literally fired me from those decisions. They said, no, listen, you just, you cannot keep creating products. You just can't. And I sat down and I realized, yeah, this is confusing the hell out of my audience, right? They buy all the stuff and I make great money. But if we, if we narrow it down to the one thing, the one signature program that I know is going to make the biggest difference from th for them, that's going to be the best move. So what I did was when you go to my website two weeks from now when it's done, uh, you're going to see that I have all of the levels very, very clear. You can join my community. You can have a done for your service or a done with your service. And then there's the course. So yes, it's multiple products, but it's different levels uh, and different uh, investment, right? So what I do is, depending on my target audience, because I told you guys I have two, for the first one, the established business owners is the done for your services. For the um, people who are in the beginning stages of their business, it's the branding and social media course, right? Because that course covers everything they need to know to get to the point where they can then come and work with me because they can afford it. So I made it very simple. I'm going to do a webinar selling the course. I do live videos and it all leads people to the same place. So how do you choose the product? Well, I asked, first of all, I do a lot of, um, a lot of polls and surveys for my audience. And I feel like that's so underestimated. People just don't do it. Now, listen, there's two ways to do that. Number one, you sound like a desperate asshole being like, guys, I don't know what to do. My business is not working out. So tell me what I need to sell to you. What would you pay for? And you're laughing, but I see that all the time. Every single day I see people doing that. The other way is to understand positioning at least a little bit and make it seem like, hey guys, you know, so I'm thinking about you. How can I help you even better? What products would you like me to create or keep? Boom. So when I asked that in my group, everybody wanted me to keep the branding course. There were tons of people saying, yeah, I'm almost there. I can almost afford it now. Please don't remove it. There were people buying it just because they saw it on the poll. <laughs> Literally, when you remind your audience, they take action. So please don't forget to ask. You're not creating these products for yourself. You're creating them for other people. So it's not what you want. It's what they want. Mm. So one final thing for me before I'm sure George has got a whole list of questions as well. And that's, and that's positioning. I know obviously when I met you in Thailand at Mitch Miller's Project Persuasion event, um, Mitch spoke about positioning, you spoke about positioning, 
you just, I think everyone spoke about positioning and how important it is, especially in the game of social media and what's going down. So when someone fresh to the industry or fresh to any industry walks in, they open their Instagram or their Facebook and they're like, I want to be seen as an authority. What are the steps that they need to take? And I'm assuming one of them is get results, obviously, but assume <laughs> they're getting great results and they can actually change people's lives. Um, what are the steps they need to take to make sure their positioning is increasing over time? Yeah, so absolutely. First of all, I don't work with people who are not able to get results, so we don't even talk about that here. I'm sure you don't either. So there are three steps I personally identify when it comes to positioning yourself as an expert, right? Positioning yourself as that voice of your marketplace, because that's what everybody wants, really. The first one is building the emotional connection. So a lot of people skip this step because they think, oh, my story is not important. You know, people have heard enough of those. They're all the same. My audience is tired of it. It doesn't matter. But the thing is, you don't know that. And making assumptions on behalf of your audience is not a good thing to do. It's the same thing when you get on a sales call with someone and you decide they cannot afford you. So you either don't pitch or you you lowball yourself. It's exactly the same thing. You're making an assumption, an uneducated assumption too, as the worst one. So yes, stories are important. And there's a lot of um, psychological experiments. There's a lot of data on the fact that stories actually sell that when a person is um, has two brands with the exact same two products in front of him, so let's say it's two coaches, right, for example, fitness coaches, business coaches, doesn't matter. One of these people he's already familiar with because he knows his story. The other person someone completely new. Same price, same product. They will 85% of the time go with the person they're familiar with. It's called the familiarity principle. Um, stories predate language, if you think about it. They literally, we've been telling stories since before we had a cohesive way to communicate with each other via words. So don't ever underestimate the emotional connection. The best way right now in 2018, I mean, two years from now, 80% of the content will be videos. So if you're not live streaming right now, it's most likely a problem because I bet that your competition is. Um, so that's one of the best ways because people are able to see your gestures. They're able to see how you reply to their questions. Do you get rattled? Do you get embarrassed? You know, so that's very important to them. When you hide behind social media posts, even if it's your face there, it's not the same thing. What do it's people do if they're scared, though, of live streaming? Because we get this a lot. They don't want to fuck up. They don't want to be in that position of being vulnerable. Like, how do we get yeah. people over that? And are they allowed to fuck up before it ruins their positioning? So there's different ways of fucking up. So yeah, you're definitely allowed to. There's one thing that I call strategic vulnerability. So this is when, yes, it's very important for you to be vulnerable, but it doesn't mean you should <laughs> you should go on live video and splash your entire life. Like, oh, my husband broke up with me. I, I had a one night standing up pregnant. Like <laughs> nobody gives a shit. Like don't do that. Strategic vulnerability means you cannot show, <laughs> you cannot show vulnerability before you've shown competence. That's the way for you to think about it. So that really helps because you know, oh, if these people haven't heard anything valuable from me and I just go and open myself up, they're gonna see me as this great storyteller, but they're not necessarily gonna follow me because of my business tips, fitness tips, whatever. So that's the most important thing. Uh, and then storytelling is a very interesting aspect of business. A lot of people think storytelling is writing a post, being like, once upon a time, I decided to become a fitness instructor and then it was all unicorns and butterflies and my clients have great results. Here's three testimonials. <laughs> That's not storytelling. Storytelling permeates your entire business. It needs to be everywhere. So if you decide to adopt that, and my recommendation is that you do, it needs to be on your website, all of your social media presence, your visuals need to also consistently tell a story, right? So this is all part of building the emotional connection. Once you're done with that stage, the second stage of positioning yourself as an expert is building trust. So the way you build trust, this is where you share a lot of value with your audience. But here's the key, specific value. What most people do if you go on your Facebook feed and scroll down for 38 minutes, you're going to see a lot of generic advice. You're going to see stuff like consistency is the key to success. Now go ahead and be successful. You know, oh, you want to lose weight? Stop eating. You know, it's like this this bullshit, this regurgitated advice that is not even true most of the time. And people really think they're sharing value when they do that. So what I do 
my strategy twice a month or three times if I have the time, I go really deep into an aspect of branding. Just the other day, I published a post on um, lifestyle branding. What do you do to build a lifestyle brand and what are the myths around it? That post, I think it had at least 3,000 right. words. It was massive, right? And I, it continued on my business page too. So I go deep. I talk about the psychology, the neuroscience behind branding. I go really deep into data, into studies, experiments. And when people see that, they think, wow, she spent so much time. She really cares about us. And then they start tagging you when someone asks for a recommendation. And that's when you know your content is working. So we got an emotional connection. We got trust. And the third stage to build authority of uh, positioning yourself as an expert is building authority. So you build authority through one thing and one thing mostly, which is sharing case studies and testimonials, going live on video and telling people the story of how you helped this client. Share your screen, get Ecamm or Manicamp. They're great for live streaming if you have MacBook or Windows. And you can share slides, you can share your screen, you can go through the entire case study, or you can invite the person there and do it together. Those are the kinds of things people know they should be doing, but they never take the time. It's so bad. Another thing that works really well is cross-promotion. Again, something so simple, and I tell all my clients to do that. We make an entire plan, and next time they come, they're like, so Des, I didn't have the time. <laughs> so really, I know. I know it takes time, but remember, there's a few people in your industry that you definitely want to be collaborating with. These are people that if you brand yourself by association with them, it's going to massively elevate your brand, your business, and open the doors to an entire new audience for you. So don't hesitate. Um, prioritize it. So those are the three stages that it takes to position yourself as an expert. And it's your responsibility to know which stage the majority of your audience is going through at any point of time. Because audience, uh, obviously, obviously, you keep expanding, you keep expanding your audience. So let's say you've added a, a thousand new people in the month of August. Well, that means that all of them are stuck on the first stage because they don't know anything else, right? So that means keep sharing most of the stories, hit a break with the other two, maybe 10%, 10%, 80%. So I look at it in terms of percentage always because I have a specific system, but I hope this is helpful. Yeah, Ooh. for sure. And just before we go on to this, um, just to remind us myself, questions around structuring content, we've got to come back to that because uh, I know Des have had a comment sort of, a comment in a comment in the chat before with you about who should be writing content and who shouldn't be. And it's a huge topic inside our community. Uh, there's hundreds of fit pros all the time. Like, I can't do this much content. I can't do it. I can't do it. Um, but George, before I do that, because I feel like there might be something you wanted to add on to what Des said. That's cool, um, man. That's, we gonna go, that's go cool. Go straight into go it. Straight into it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, content, let's get into the good stuff. So the, the guys and girls who have not been following Des, I'm sure you will be afterwards and you'll be like, shit, this girl creates an astronomical amount of quality content. That's the difference. It's it's quality and it really is. Um, how does it happen, Des? Like, let's go back to the story of copywriting because I feel that's so important to understand copywriting as a foundation for content. I might be wrong, um, but it's more than just posting selfies all the time, right? <laughs> well... <laughs> I post selfies all the time, excuse me, but <laughs> but there's so much more behind it. Um, first of all, it's not necessary. A lot of people seem to, it's so funny. When I started doing this, <laughs> very few people were. And I thought, nobody else is going to start. It's all narcissistic. It's my thing. <laughs> Today, you open Facebook and you see everybody's face just staring at you from their feed. And I'm like, Jesus, people, why are you, what are you doing? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> just a small off topic. So yeah, copywriting is important to understand, obviously, for creating high quality content, but there are a lot of people out there who, for example, either English is not their first language, so their grammar and everything is not perfect, so they think, oh, it shouldn't be me, I should just hire out, oh, but I can't afford it, so they're stuck in this mindset. That's really not true. One of the most, one of the biggest authorities in the mindset industry right now, uh, which is funny because I forgot her name, she, I'm on her email list, right? So she... Her emails are full of typos, grammar mistakes. It's a nightmare for a person like me. I cannot even stand it, and yet I keep reading. But her ideal clients, they are absolutely in love with it. To them, this opens a whole new door, of a whole new aspect of her vulnerability. The fact that she is a millionaire and she doesn't want to hire a copywriter, she keeps doing it herself. And to them, she's a woman of the people. You know, she keeps doing it on her own. So you don't have to be a perfect copywriter. It's all about emotions. 
Because obviously, when you look at logic and emotions, which one of these pushes people to buy more? It's always emotions. Even if you consider yourself a very logical, analytical person, it's emotions that are going to get you to go on the other side of this and hit the buy button. So I feel like I don't know what question you asked me because I just keep going. going. <laughs> so around <laughs> around structuring content, oh, yeah. um, I was just saying like the importance of copywriting is like a foundation of making content. I feel like it is. Yeah. Uh, and people should spend time learning to write, just oh, yeah. even if it's a couple of months, just to be like, okay, I need to get this as a foundation. Um, but yeah, when it comes to structuring your content, I know you spoke about content themes before, the importance yes. of having brand guidelines. Uh, this is the stuff that that people aren't aware of. I most certainly wasn't until I met you. So if we could dive into that, brand guidelines, content themes, and, and why it's so important to content, it'd be great. Perfect. So what I do, okay, let's dial it back. So one of the things I do for clients is I create a brand strategy first and a digital marketing strategy afterwards, right? Because these cannot exist without each other. You need both in order to properly create content and properly position yourself. So in the brand strategy, there's something called brand personality, right? So here's where we we sit down and we define your brand personality. This is the language you're going to use to speak to your, to your audience. And I don't mean English, duh. I mean, how are you going to sound? Are you going to be friendly, professional, casual, super formal? Are you going to be supportive? Are you going to be uh, arrogant? You know, because there's people who pull that off and it works great. Um, so the way I do it, I use something called the contrast method. So you sit down and instead of defining how you want people to perceive you, you also define your limits. So let's say, let's take me as an example. I'm, I have a very bold social media presence, um, and it's a very, very confident one. So oftentimes people misread that and see me as arrogant, which most of the time is not a problem. But when your ideal clients see you that way, then it becomes a problem, right? So the way I did it, I sat down and I defined it and I said, okay, so confident, but not arrogant. It's just one phrase, literally just one phrase and you put it down there. And then, you know, this is your limit to creating content. If it becomes arrogant, you stop yourself, dial it back, rewrite it. Then we have friendly, but not casual. You want to per be perceived as friendly, but you want to be perceived as too casual because your ideal clients do not, do not relate to that. Maybe they're corporate clients, right? They will not hire you if you're too casual. Most of them anyway. So that's the first thing, defining your brand personality. Once you have that, now you know how you should sound and how you should not sound. Then you take all of that and you move into the digital um, and social media strategy, which is where you ha we have the content themes. So the content themes, these are consistent little narratives that you narrow down between three to five. Most people have four. Let's say you define four content themes. So, for example, mine are, the first one is my roots. So, this is something that's never going to change. One of the most important things that I want my audience to know about me is where I come from. And that's one, always the first thing that I say when I'm doing a podcast interview or whatever. I remind them I'm from Bulgaria. It's a country that is, let's say, less fortunate. So, that way they know that, hey, if I'm here doing this right now, that means I've accomplished a lot. So, now they have this idea of me in their minds. Um, so... Basically, your content themes are all of the little narratives about your life and your business that if your audience does not know about you, you're in trouble because they will never understand you. And confused people don't buy. I like repeating that all the time. Confused people don't buy people. Um, they need to be able to understand you and to go, oh, my God. Oh, I see why he or she's doing that. It makes complete sense. They need to be able to predict what products and services you're going to launch. For instance, the reason I created the retreat is because I did a survey and there were a lot of people asking when I'm going to start doing real life events and retreats. And I said, hmm, OK, perfect. So they literally reverse engineered products from my story because they know my story and they know this is going to be great for the brand and for them, too. So my roots, then, for example, you need remember the three stages of positioning yourself as an expert. You take those and you implement them into your content themes. You connect them. So you need content themes that foster the emotional connection, that build trust and that build authority. My authority building theme, and you're, you're going to laugh at that, is, <laughs> is that uh, I'm unavailable. Right. So it's very, very difficult to get a hold of me, not because I'm a bitch. Really? Yeah, it's not because of that, but because it's just I receive hundreds and hundreds of messages every single day and I forget. I forget what I was who I was talking to yesterday, right? 
So here's a little story that's going to take me one minute to tell. I once published on my Facebook wall um, just a few lines of text and I said, guys, I'm sorry if you have messaged me and I haven't replied. I have started receiving hundreds of messages per day, so it's going to be tough, so don't get offended, right? That was two years ago. Ever since then, the entire perception of me completely changed. So whenever I would receive a message before that, it would be, you bitch, why are you not replying? Who do you think you are? Afterwards, it started being, oh my God, this, I'm so sorry. I know you're so busy. I completely, you don't even have to answer me, but here's my question just in case you decide to read it. Completely different perception. So when people know I'm unavailable, they want me even more, right? They want to get access to me even more. That's how people like their entire brands by turning it into a commodity by by distancing themselves from the business and being very very hard to reach how would you do that without being arrogant without being arrogant Ooh. Mm. yeah there's a there's a fine line so basically sometimes you have to deal with the fact that a lot of people are going to think you're arrogant a lot of people think that i get blocked on average by 20 people per day that's a real statistic my team found it <laughs> which is completely fine because they're not my ideal client. So if those are the people who think you're arrogant, don't even bother. They're just opening up a place for people who don't, right? So that's one of the things I want to say. And the other one is just be careful of the way you express yourself. So don't say, you know, hey, if you want to, if you want to reach me, fuck you. Like I'm unreachable. I'm not going to talk to you. You don't deserve me, <laughs> obviously. Just, just spin it in a way that makes sense to them. So Ask for their empathy subconsciously. Empathy is really where it's at because if you get to the point where people feel empathetic towards you and your journey without feeling sorry for you, that's very important. Then you have all of their attention and you have all of their understanding. And what happens if they're shy? If we take the opposite, if they're, let's say, more introverted, how do we get that message that we are an authority out there? Because I think that's a big fear of people who have got a great message, but they don't feel like they're allowed to stand on that mountaintop and shout their message yet. How do they get that confidence to do so? You know what? I've had clients who are quite shy. One of them right now. So she was so shy that she never wanted to be in front of a camera. And when I asked her for a testimonial, because she was in, in uh, my private community, she said, this, I'm sorry, I cannot do a testimonial because I cannot be in front of a camera. I'm terrified. So she literally did not do a testimonial. And yesterday, she and her husband launched their new business with a one-hour live video. She's been live streaming every day since then. So the way she got over that was one of the things was people started interviewing her, right? So one of the things is, again, cross-promotion people. When you are being interviewed by someone else, it is not on you to speak and to share. You get questions, you answer them. It is so much easier. So you have no choice other than just hit the red X and exit the interview. But hey, that's embarrassing. And our minds work in a way that you you will choose not to be embarrassed that way. You will choose to be embarrassed by answering instead. I can guarantee you that very few people are going to leave. So that's one of the ways to kind of get over your shyness. I always recommend that and every single time it works. And if you're having trouble getting someone to interview you, you would be surprised. Like one of the strategies is go to your favorite Facebook groups find the admin and tell them, hi, so I've been dropping lots of value in your group um, and I would love to be interviewed in it to share some more value for your community. I'm planning to talk about this and this and this. How about it? People would be stupid not to take you up on it. Most of them do. I've done it as well. And they will appreciate your bravery for reaching out too. Nice. Wow. Wow. I've got to say, that was some seriously... Seriously powerful stuff, Des. Really, really interesting. And Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, you clearly know your stuff. <laughs> you were able to stick to, to your three points, like, I solidly. Think, I think it's testament to how much time you've put into live streaming. Um, like, on mm. a suit, let's try and make this productive for people. Because, um, Des, you're clearly very, without trying to make you even more arrogant, <laughs> um, you're very competent in what you do, right? And that gives you the confidence. Competence and confidence are these interlinking things. And that's occurred, like you said, because you were like, fuck this, I'm going to get on camera and I'm going to live stream. And I think I've seen you say before, like you're doing it two to three times a day for like some exceedingly long period of time. <laughs> like it's so transferable being able to speak because now there's like, I know you've done your TEDx talk. That has been done, right? I'm not just dropped a Yes, bomb. yes. <laughs> <laughs> you've done your TEDx talk, you've been featured on all these magazines, you're getting to speak more and more and more all over the world. Uh, and a lot of that, I guess, has all stemmed from that ability to do those live streams from day yeah. one. 
absolutely. Yeah. So I find it really interesting um, that if we have, have got that fear, we should be doing live streaming more often and, and, and not getting distracted and being like, I need the perfect microphone, I need the perfect backdrop. Oh, God, no. You should see the, oh, my God. I uh, filmed a course, an Instagram course, two, two and a half years ago. <laughs> I filmed it in my kitchen, no microphone, the screwed up camera on my old Dell laptop, uh, <laughs> and it was no lights. Like I, I was, I had to film for two hours because in Denmark, that's all I got of sunlight every single day. Um, so I had a two hour time frame to film. It was a horribly looking course, but the content was super powerful. People bought it. I made I made five thousand dollars from that when I launched it. It's and I had no idea how to even sell. All I did was I got on a live video and I talked about it and I said, "So guys, here it is." And during the live video, a ton of people hit the buy button. So really, the cool thing about live video is yes, I have a specific structure that I teach where I follow a certain template. I even have scripts to sell without feeling like a sleaze because I know that's the problem for most people. They feel like selling sleazy, which really isn't. Um, but you, you cannot re-educate them. You have to meet them where they are, right? That's my mantra. So it doesn't feel like selling when you're on live video because you have all these people paying attention, really bonding with you. You're establishing that emotional connection. So when you say grab the course, they do it. It's completely different than asking them to buy on a, even on a webinar, completely different scenario because they know you're going to sell something there and they know that's the whole purpose of it. On a live video, it feels a lot more authentic. Desiree, touched on because i started writing a post today but i had to stop for some stuff went down um but it's around the idea of being able to sell on social platforms and i'm a big believer that there's very few people in my feeds who consistently sell like you do and maybe mitch and there's certain individuals who sell very well from social feeds in my personal experience uh, i find it a lot easier to sell from a facebook group and from an email list um i don't know if you've had any like real I don't know, testing on this personally, or if you think it's personality types or people's skill. But for me, I think there's a lot of value in people moving those people into a group because it's an easy environment to sell in uh, and on an email list. Do you buy into that or do you just think that's laziness or you haven't quite nailed the skill yet of selling on social platforms, on the feed that is? Actually, I think you're completely right for a very simple reason. When you when you build a community, that community needs a unified place to exist. So if you randomly try to sell with your personal account or your Facebook page, it's not the same. Yes, it works, but it works sporadically. It's not the same as funneling them all to the group and making them feel like a community. Because I also teach the process of building a loyal community of brand ambassadors, right? And one of the things is always have a unified place. So no, it's not lazy at all. Actually, that's the most difficult thing for a lot of people because they have no clue how to get people from point A to point B, which is the group. Which to me is the easiest thing because literally my model is throw a ton of value bombs at them, throw the link to the group, tell them that's where the continual... The continued post is, oh my God, you get hundreds of people wanting to hear the rest because they're hooked. So no, it's not the lazy way. However, I do believe that every single person can sell with their content, whether it's in a group or not. It's all about learning a few very, very simple strategies. And that's it. Then you just follow the same thing over and over again. I have a few post templates that I've done that have been very successful that I keep reusing when I'm selling on my Facebook page or on my Instagram page, for example feed yeah i'm pretty sure i've saved them and then i try and model them without copying them directly <laughs> <laughs> actually yeah a lot of people did that because i can see that the structure has been old and i think it's great i mean that's why i did it right it's not like i'm gonna do it in secret and be like don't take my stuff that's the whole point sharing what's your what's your thoughts on uh having your content copied how do you feel about this or better having your following stolen as so, number one following stolen what do you yeah, mean yeah so so people people trying to, to claim their work sorry your work as their own and then pulling who your potential following would be towards them oh my god that happens to me <laughs> probably on a daily basis it's so fun i love it because it's so pathetic it's like another level of pathetic it's really really fun for me 
So it's there was this one particular day when I was with you in Thailand, actually, <laughs> when I woke up to head over to the to the venue, right? And I saw my post that I wrote the previous day selling a masterclass being taken and copied word for word. In fact, one person took the photo that went with it, which was a photo of me, and posted it on his own account selling his course. That doesn't even make sense, people. Seriously, my face is not going to sell your stuff, no matter how good looking it is. <laughs> Excuse me. So it's fine when you steal other people's stuff if you give credit because then it's not stealing. Like that's the clever way to do it. Take whatever you want, give credit and give, give credit and you can get away with it. But honestly, it diminishes your brand authority because even though you think your audience is not going to notice, it takes one person to give a link to the original post and you're dead. Nobody else is going to trust you ever again if they see that. Mm. I think that's really amazing as well, speaking about growing an audience who fight for you. I think you've talked about this before as well. When you build that community, it's like you can just let them do the work. When or some questions, morals or whatever it is, it just allows you to stand back and just be like, I think that positions you even higher, right? Absolutely. And also when you, for example... Just a few days ago, I uh, I made a post to my audience. Hey guys, there's this uh, Forbes nomination list for Forbes 30 under 30. I have three years left. Please, you know, nominate me. Here's the link. There were hundreds and hundreds of people just writing and writing these massive comments, just recommending me. And the fun thing is then other people realized they can do that. So they started doing the same with their community. So then five of us just took over the whole thing. And now it has over 800 comments. Poor guy. Is going to be able to read and read for days but when they actually defend you from from haters and from trolls that's when you know you've done your job and it's tough you need to if you want to get there then you have to work a lot on the first stage the emotional connection because if they don't know your character your values and don't connect to those they'll never stand up for you like that no matter how much value you provide Des, is there any like noticeable fuck ups where you don't regret, because I'm sure you don't, because you learned from a lot of them, but where you've maybe pushed it too far, because uh, I, I think that's a fear for a lot of people, is going a little bit too far, and they look back, and in hindsight, they're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. And if you do have any, uh, is there any things that you can do today that stop you doing that again, like repeating those same errors where you've probably gone a little bit too too much in one direction? With me, I'm not being cocky. I honestly can say no, because whatever I've done that has been arrogant or whatever, I always have a strategy behind it. But I can give you a great example of someone from my audience. If you listen to this podcast, I know I know it's about you. Please don't take offense. We've talked about it. I told you it was a fuck up. OK, so actually Mitch told him too, like a lot of us told him. Um, so he's a great guy. Right. But that's the way he says it is. Okay, so I always teach how branding is about identity and perception. It's those two things. That's about it. So if there's a gap in between that, then you need to rebrand yourself. And he always says, yeah, I'm more on the identity side. I don't care how people perceive me. And that's where he, everything goes wrong for him. So he made a post where basically he was talking about how he's really struggling financially, how his bank account is on minus, and he feels like he reposts his clients. It was a long post, and he put it publicly on his personal Facebook account where his entire following is. And it was me and Mitch, I think, who commented first. And we were like, dude, uh, well, Mitch was a little bit more harsh than me. <laughs> he was like, fuck you. What are you doing? Like, stop it. I, I actually said, you know, this is diminishing your authority because positioning is the space you own in your audience's minds. And you're stuck with it. Yes, you can influence perception. But if you don't know how to do it, you're stuck with what they already have in, in here. So right now, even a few I think it's been three or four months I still think about that post when I think about him and I know he's a great guy and everything but seeing your repost clients and that your bank account is on minus he turned off a lot of potential clients a lot of potential and I think he runs ads for clients if I'm not mistaken so how do you trust someone who says something like that and puts it out there publicly knowing he cannot make money for himself but he's supposed to be making money for your business it doesn't work like that. So that's one of the major fuck ups I've seen in the last half a year, maybe. Um, and then we have big brands like Nike doing <laughs> interesting stuff, too. But for people like us, it's usually not understanding how positioning works. That's yeah. where all of the problems come from. And yeah. and when you fuck up, my advice is don't be stubborn about it. OK, do what a massive brand would do. 
pull the post, apologize, right? It depends. It depends. Like, if Mitch does that, it would be weird, and his audience would be like, have you lost your mind? <laughs> right? So it depends on how much you can get away with. But that guy, for example, that would have made sense to remove the post and not speak of it ever again so that people forget, right? But it became a massive conversation. There were hundreds of comments, so now everyone remembers. So it's all about what you do after you screw up. Yeah, for sure. Reputation so I've got a couple of questions. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions from the group right now, uh, which I'd love to get answered. Some of them I'm going to leave out because I'm sure you've had them many times before, Des. Um, but one of the one of the big ones we get is: Is it best for me to create a personal brand, or when should I create like James Moody Fitness, or should I create a real business like Naked Nutrition, as example, my old fitness business? Um, how do we decide what we should go down? It's funny, this is probably the number one thing people come to me for. And I swear, I've had clients who, this was the main thing they hired me for, just this one thing, because it really is tough. Um, what I can say is, obviously, I would need to look into your brand and your business and your audience and your processes and everything to figure out what the right way to go is. But if I were to give generic piece of advice, it would be any way to bring personal touch into your business will help you scale faster. And a lot of people don't connect their personal brands to their, their business because they're afraid that they cannot scale that way and they cannot sell it one day. All I can say is look at Gary Vee. Yes, you can scale it. You can scale it massively. I'm scaling mine. You can scale it to tens of millions of dollars. And you can sell it because a rebranding process doesn't take more than a few months and you can completely distance yourself from your from that brand if you want to sell it. So that is not a problem. I know that's what most people are worried about. So to the question, which one should you start? It's all about are you comfortable with being the face of your business? And when you look five to ten years down the line, which most people really don't do, they think month for month. Um, what are you seeing? Are you the CEO? Have you relinquished control to someone else? Does the business circle around your image? For example, I'm a huge narcissist. My business is completely based on my image, right? So I know 10 years down the line, that's how it's going to be. Gary Vee style, Tony Robbins style. But a lot of people don't want that. So in that case, it pays off to do it agency style, for example. Show up. Show up in the story. On the about page of your website, you need to you need to be present there. You need to tell them you're the one who started this business. This is how it developed, blah, blah. This is how I started it. Up, appear from time to time in the social media presence. If you feel completely uncomfortable with that, then adopt a different face. But the business needs to have a face. In 2018, if someone tells you differently, oof, it's going to be really tough for you to scale. Mm -hmm. For sure. George, you got anything on that before I throw in more? Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's basically what Virgin did and, and Richard Branson. I'm, I'm reading Richard Branson's book right now, so, like, every time we get into any kind of conversation like this, I'm like, oh, Richard Branson. But, yeah. He's um, my favorite. I love Richard Branson. Yeah, he, he sold uh, Virgin uh, Music, his uh, recording agency, recording yeah. company, um, which was his first business. He sold that. Basically, he built it. It was all about him. Virgin's all about yeah, him. But exactly. He's been able to just absolutely nail it because he had the the personal attachment to it, his personal story, but the brand in itself has has become bigger and bigger than him. Exactly. So. That's the thing. That's a great way to put it. When the brand becomes bigger than you, that's exactly what happens. And you know what? A lot of people still think that, he, that it still belongs to him. That's how big the brand has become. So yeah. honestly, it's not even about you. It's all about people seeing the value in it. Mm. and uh something i wanted to mention earlier when you were saying that you should only have one thing that you're selling um if you if if i recall how richard talks about his different businesses you know he's got the airline he's yeah. got the uh the media companies the phone companies and all that stuff he created a company for a product it was like one company that had one product and it would be a yeah. separate business entirely which i feel i thought was fascinating so when you can become that much of an authority, you can just yeah. have that big brand and be like, we're just going to start a new product that's run by a new business. So That's a brilliant that cool. strategy that very few people can pull off, unfortunately. But the stuff we've been discussing so far, it's for people wanting to get to that point, right? Yeah. When you are at that point, you don't have to think about any of that stuff because you can do whatever the hell you want. People <laughs> are going to buy it, love you, and love you some more, right? So... If you want to get there, I'm not saying sell just one thing, 
but focus on just one thing, right? So for example, for me, I have different launches throughout the year. I have a retreat, I have a community, I have whatever. But I do the launch one month, I take one month, month off, no launches, then I do the other one. I give people time to relax and give them time to prepare for the next one so I don't confuse the hell out of them. That's very important to not confuse your audience. Confuse mm. people, don't buy. <laughs> Love it. What, what were you going to say, James? With the... uh, yeah, something came up in my head there about what we were just talking about, Richard Branson branding. Oh, that was it. Pre-selling courses before you make them. This is something that we're really hot on. Once you build that audience who trusts you, it's like you were saying with that survey when you put it out, like, what do you want me to build next? And then they tell you what you want to build and then it's like, well, actually pay me money and then I'll go and build it. That's an amazing place to be. And I think we, we've finally managed to do that, especially with our internal community, where we can now sort of put a message out and be like, we're doing this, it's this much, pay now, and then we'll, we'll think about doing it later kind of thing. Um, it's a massive goal and I'd, I'd definitely stress to anyone who has building that coaching brand and everything else, whether it's in fitness or outside, it's to strive to the point where your audience loves you that much, where you can just be like, boom, drop a product and they pay straight up. So that aside, uh, Des, I've got a couple more questions and we'll wrap this up. Enjoy your backpacks with Thailand, um, which we'll talk about as well because I know you've got some cool stuff to go down. Um, one of them on, on visual branding, uh, Des, if we can just get into that. When, do, when should you start considering uh, like investing in your visual branding? Well, is, there, is there an order? Because people like they've got, let's say it's a grand to go and get out their logo, then another grand for their website, and another grand for this. Some people get really tied up on it, and it almost immobilizes them. We find that a lot. Um, when should we hold off on branding is what I'm trying to get out here. I see that a lot in my clients too. Um, so for example, there are people who sell just websites and visual branding. There are people who just sell st brand strategy, right? Which used to be me, but now we're turning into a whole agency style thing with scaling. Um, so the thing is, a lot of people, it's all about education. It just pisses me off because people are spreading wrong information all the time. People think branding is a logo, branding is a website, you know, branding is your social media cover photo. It's not. Branding is identity and perception. And what you do with that is your choice. But you have to start internally. You have to start with knowing your purpose, your brand values, your personality, your ideal client. That's what I really dive deep into with my clients. You have to know um, your origin story. That's really the center of everything. That's why I always spend 60 minutes with every single client. And all we do is talk about their story. Because then I can take that and create their entire brand strategy from scratch. Um, so you always start there only and after only you've done all of this, then you're able to move on to websites and visual identity because if I'm not just saying it because I want people to pay me money, I'm saying it because if you start with websites and visual identity and after a couple of months or a couple of years decide, Oh, I made a mistake. Let me do the brand strategy. Now the website is going to be completely, it all needs to be changed at that point because you realize, Oh, those are not the right colors for me. Those are not the right fonts. Those are, this is not the right visual at all. I want simplicity and this is all chaotic and a nightmare. This has happened to me, so I know it very well. And I am a brand strategist. Like It happens to everyone. And it happens to most of my clients. They already have websites when they come to me. So then we have to rebrand the whole thing. I have to take my designers, splash them on the website and take thousands and thousands of dollars because they screwed up the first time, right? They did the website first. Yeah, huge, great advice. So with that, Des, if people do want to find out more about you, and I know we're going to talk about this Thailand event event because you're moving to Thailand, uh, where should people go? What's the main platform they should get Des on? And uh, what's exciting in the in the near future for you? You can all find me on desdebreva.com or anywhere on social media as desdebreva, very consistent. Also, another branding tip, have the same username everywhere, for God's sake, because you're going to make it very tough on people to find you if you don't. And yeah, I'm moving to Thailand in exactly two days. I can't even believe it. Time went by so so fast. And actually, when I met James for the first time, that's when I decided I'm moving to Thailand. So <laughs> it's been an interesting journey. Wow. And, uh, so it's Chiang yeah. Mai, right? Yeah, I'm going to Chiang Mai. You know, I like You'll be beaches. the richest person there. <laughs> oh, come on. You know, this is seriously, the whole stereotyping thing is hilarious. But yeah. I get it. I get it. Four people go there. Um, <laughs> it's very cheap. Uh, maybe I'm broken. That's why I'm moving. You know, I'm going to tease my audience with that. I'm going to tell them my business failed and I'm moving to Chiang Mai to survive. Let's see if they buy it. This is where you heard it first, people. 
Um, so yeah, I'm moving to Chiang Mai. It's mountains and lakes and stuff. <laughs> and I'm running a retreat, which is not happening there actually, because we realize that people want more than mountains when they come to Thailand. So obviously, <laughs> we're doing it on a private estate in a private island. Well, not private island. It's Koh Samui instead, because we thought, hmm, when people come to Thailand, they don't want to stay in a hotel. They want, don't want to stay in just some house. They want to stay in some private estate with a private beach, private infinity pools, chefs, um, spa, and all that stuff. And obviously, this is my first retreat, so I should be very careful and very like low key with it. But no, apparently I go big. So but that's not you, Des, is it? Big. Being low key. Yeah, <laughs> not careful at all. Rented a whole fucking estate, putting twenty people in there, and let's see how it goes. <laughs> so, is there any spots left? Uh, can people still jump on board if they want to find out more? We are about half full. I barely promoted it, but I'm starting to now. The price is rising in a few days. Rising, raising. I don't know, in a few days. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see who joins. But the cool thing about it is that my audience is so um, diverse. So we have people from all industries. We have people doing SEO. We have a guy doing 30 million per year and wanting to get to 100. We have people doing tapping, very spiritual stuff. Um, we have people doing content. So it's going to be super, super interesting to see how they all get together and our goal, because I'm running it with one of my partners, Simone, he's the king of sales, I'm the queen of branding, so it fits perfectly. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see the networking because our goal was to put a lot of different people together in different stages of their business, except if you don't have a business yet, then you cannot come. Like You need to be at least half established um, and to be able to afford it, of course, because we don't want it to be a burden. So it's going to be really interesting to see them talk to each other and develop partnerships and interview each other and all of that. Yeah, yeah. George, have you got the business credit card? <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's right here. <laughs> Take my money. <laughs> yeah, so, cards are out, people. <laughs> Bitcoin's in. Let's go. Crypto. Yeah, so, true, true. Let's not, get, let's not get into crypto. With that said, um, there's, there's one final thing, Des. Oh, before I do jump into the final question, uh, courses and stuff, if people are brand new, because I know we just spoke about your high-end stuff. Uh, if someone's brand spanking new, uh, what can they do if they want to learn more about branding? Yeah, so my branding course is I have a lot of people coming to me who are just super excited, who are just beginning, but it doesn't feel right to take them on board because I would just be taking their money and doing stuff with them that is way too advanced. So I always refer them back to the branding course. That's why I have it. As I said, it's b brilliant because they go through it and then they are finally ready after a few months because the course teaches you how to build a six-figure business, essentially. It's branding, social media. I'm even adding more on sales in there. I'm constantly updating it. I'm increasing the price because now we're doing a complete rebranding of the branding course. How fun is that? So if you want to learn more uh, on the beginner side, plus here and there are some advanced strategies, then this course is going to teach you everything you need to know. Sweet. And that's at desdebrevo.com, right? They go to the same yeah. spot. Yeah. Awesome. Sweet. So final thing, Des, uh, this is really timely, I feel, because of your move to Thailand. But the question is, what does freedom mean to you? Exactly that. <laughs> Telling people I'm moving to a new country every few months and them going, I want to do that. You know, how can you do that? And to that, I reply, branding, my friend. <laughs> I understand how positioning works. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag buy my stuff no i'm kidding it really is for me p understanding how positioning works has been the number one thing to get to the point where i'm free to do whatever i want so to me freedom is it's a state of being it's a state of existing that nothing else can compare to Boom. Nice. on that note i think we should wrap up the show yeah it's been an absolute pleasure uh, everyone go check her out we'll put some links around but don't be lazy whip out your phone and uh at des de braver and uh, go follow. <laughs> Thanks very much, Des. Thank you, Des. Thank you so much for having me, everyone. It's been, it's been a, pleasure. a pleasure. Peace out. See ya. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Remote Revolution Show. If you enjoyed the show, please head across to iTunes, YouTube, and our other social media platforms to leave us a quick rating and review. 
And if you'd like your questions answering, we'd love to hear from you. So please send them into info at remoterevolutionshow.com. And please remember the show is all about growing the remote revolution. So if you wish to join the community and scale your business, then please head over to www.remoterevolutionshow.com or click the link in the show notes to grab our free download. Yes, seriously, don't be lazy. Click the link in the show notes and grab the downloads. And as always, we'll see you next week.